teacher for 12 years, and I'm now a doctoral student, and um, I'm going to be talking about reading conferences. So, um, for people who use reading workshop, reading conferences is a very big part of what a reading workshop is. As uh, Patrick Allen says, it's, a, it's the keystone of a reading conference. And in his definition, it's a verb that it is to be consulting together. Unlike, um, you know, conference is a noun, conferring is a verb, so it should be something that we are doing, um, not just talking about. And he talks about there's multiple purposes of reading conferences and a reading workshop, and it's to discover the attitudes that the student has about um, reading, about the books that they're doing, and about um, the whole process of reading. Also to discover stand stamina and the work ethic, what are they reading and how fast and how many times and um, if uh, quite often they're using reading logs, to explore the process, how they're making meaning of reading, to record their diet, what types of genres they like, um, you know, graphic novels versus nonfiction, to also form a relationship with the students about reading, but one that's both intimate so the teacher can help the student um, choose uh, appropriate books, things that they like, and at the same time that it's rigorous, so that the teacher is able to push the student to do a little bit more than the student might think they're able to do. And then finally to gather data for assessment, which is something as teachers we all need to do. So the overarching um, study is a formative design study of two teachers during a uh, third grade readers workshop. And it's formative design because of a couple of reasons. First of all, it addresses the concerns and issues of teachers. So these two particular teachers, um, they came to me and said, we're using Calkins Reading Workshop, the, the program, the box. Um, it was their second year, and they wanted to make it more theirs rather than hers. So they wanted to be more consistent and effective with their conferences within the Reading Workshop. It also improves practices through the iterative design, or iter analysis design and development and the implementation of the intervention. So the actual conference itself, they'll have a conference, I'll record it, we'll talk about it, and then they'll do more conferences. So each time it's to improve their uh, practice. And then finally, it's collaborative. Um, I'm working with two teachers in their actual classroom, not setting up an ex uh, uh, artificial environment for it. And it is very much mutually negotiated. Um, I actually sat down with them, and together we created my dissertation research questions, which sounds like cheating, but it's really part of what this design is. So it really focuses on what they want to do and I'm there to help them. So this is one particular case of one particular reading conference because otherwise you'd be here forever. <laughs> so the main characters are Lilith, who is the third grade girl. She is, um, she is Dutch, this is her second year in um, the United States, so she's an English language learner. Her parents are very well educated and involved in school. Um, June is the teacher. It's her fourth year of teaching. She previously taught first grade, and she has a really strong background in literature and the classics. Um, she started getting her master's in literature. And then I'm Suzanne. I'm the researcher, and I have 12 years of teaching experience, including um, uh, grade 6 through 12 in lots of different subjects, and currently I'm a doctoral student. So after the conference, and this is what really focused me on this particular conference, June said, so she seemed shell-shocked by the end of my conference. And I don't know, I took something fun and made it awful. So I started thinking in the context of the broader st study, how can we better understand what happened in this particular conference that led this teacher to this conclusion about her own practice and how might this apply to other conferences? Okay, so, um, what I was looking at is what I decided to call reading the subtext. Are you seeing? Are you seeing a slide? Yeah. Okay, so um, I took data from several different places. First of all, there was the conference itself. But to understand that conference, I linked it to a couple of different um, pieces of the data. First of all, I had an interview from the student. I had an interview from the teacher. I had observations in the classroom. And then I also had um, the actual conference itself. And linking these data sources together, I could interpret the subtext of the conference. What I'm calling subtext is the emotions, experience, and memories that are recalled in response to an utterance, including the thinking and decision-making process involved in forming a response to the utterance. 
So in linking these other pieces of data to the conference itself, I noticed some patterns. One thing I noticed that June's own personal positive experiences with literature interfered with her ability to listen to what Lilith had to tell her. At the same time, June addressed the student she imagined was in front of her, one who loved and cherished poetry as much as she did, instead of Lilith, the actual student. So Matuzef and Smith calls this objectivizing and finalizing. They talk about four narrative ways of talking about or talking to students in their article. Um, the first one is a continuum of a creation of shared understanding from objectivizing, which is um, an unchecked observation or speculation, I think this is happening, to subjectivizing, which is actually checking in with the kid, asking them what they're thinking and feeling. At the sam same time, there's a continuum of a degree of certainty. Finalizing, I know this is what's going on with the student versus um, constantly asking questions. So as I was going through my data, I was looking at these two things um, and coding it according to statements that I would see, like the student said, which would be subjectivizing, versus I saw the student, because then there's assumptions involved in that. Now, neither of these are wrong. Both are very appropriate at different times. As teachers, we have to draw conclusions based on what we see to be able to go forward with teaching. However, we need to be aware of an excess of either. If we're constantly checking in with students, we'll get nothing else done. But if we're also constantly just making guesses, we could be very wrong. The same thing with the degree of certainty. Um, the finalizing would be looking at things like, I know the student likes. So you're making a very um, definite statement about that. Along with problematizing would be, I would like to know more about, or is it possible, I'm not sure. So looking at the actual conference, this is the beginning of the conference, and the teacher, um, the student comes to the conference with the book that she's currently reading and sits down, and the teacher notices that it's a book of poetry. So the teacher says, we're going to have a conference. I don't think you and I have had one. You can leave the book open right where it is. You're reading poetry right now. Poetry is, so what are you thinking of that right now? Right away, and I know this from the interview that we had afterwards, she got very caught up into these warm, fuzzy feelings of poetry, and it's wonderful and it's glorious. And she talked about how as a child she was reading poetry. Had she stated herself, I got so excited about poetry and I was thinking about poetry and my life of poetry, and the impact is right here and she noticed it afterwards, that I got so carried away with myself and my own memories and whatever and got distracted from my purpose, which was actually her. So she began to create this imaginary child. Um, however, she catches herself. So she was objectifying the child, but then she catches herself and starts to be, begin some instruction, but asks a question. So what are you thinking of that, meaning poetry? She's seeking confirmation of what the student is thinking which is a good thing. The student starts um, talking about it, but is a little unsure and starts talking about the pictures and the letters, because it was a poetry book that was um, alphabetized. Now, knowing the student from the interview before, I, I know, because she told me, the student chooses books based on pictures, not necessarily the content. Um, she likes really interesting pictures, but she also likes ice and snow and winter activities. And that was something that was very much part of this book. So I know um, going into the conference, impact on um, instruction would be she's choosing books based on the pictures. The teacher kind of glosses over that part and starts looking at a, a teaching point, an instructional point. So do you know what kind of book this is? The teacher says, no, this book is fantastic. It just happens to be Bill Martin Jr. He's his children's author that a bunch of people love and he picked all of these poems. So here she starts showing what she knows about literature and her own enthusiasm, which makes for a really great teacher um, and helps generate enthusiasm for books. However, sometimes that can overpower the student. So her enthusiasm, her values of good literature, and her instruction of what this book is silences the student at this point and continues to objectify. 
She continues with, I'm so excited that you just picked a book of poetry because it's such a good fit for you. So this is an example of finalizing the student. She made a, a statement of certainty um, that this book was a good fit for the student, thinking back to what just right books were. And she was thinking that this is short and it's easy to read, so it must be a good fit. At the same time, poetry is beautiful and wonderful, and she's going to have so much interest in it, and she's making meaning of it. Again, putting that imaginary child in front of the child in front of her. And so she found her teaching point. Is this a poem that you would like to read really well? Like you'd like to work on this poem with me? We're going to be, we're not going to be able to get it all today, but we could learn some strategies in this poem. So she made the assumption that the student, just like her, would love to read this poem out loud to everybody and to reread it. Um, and so that's, again, objectif objectivizing the student. And then the instruction, the student needs to learn how to decode better. And repeated reading is one way to get to that. So she starts going into that as her instruction. So the rest of the conference, the teacher models fluent reading of the poem. And it was a really hard poem. It was all about alliteration. Then she has a student start rereading and highlighting the decoding strategies like reading every word, reading the ending, reading the vowels. The student practices the poem, and each time with decreased fluency. So I started thinking about what is the subtext? What happened in this conference that led to this outcome? Well, first of all, the recollection of the emotions, memories, and experiences can interfere with listening. At the same time, these recollections of emotions, memories, and experience can create imaginary children. And creating imaginary children can limit understanding of the actual child. And creating imaginary children limits the effectiveness of instruction because you're not teaching the child that's actually in front of you. Now this is really easy for me to say. As the researcher, I was sitting outside the conference and I read the subtext based on my experiences. After the conference, I attempted to confirm and deny or deny my reading of the subtext with the teacher, yet at the same time being cognizant of my subtext coming into that conference. So that wonderful Mobius strip of research. So in conferring about conferencing, my goal was to understand the teacher's instructional decision process, guide the teacher to articulate her own reasons, then help her evaluate her decisions and how they impacted the conference and finally reframe her practice for the next one. So to do so, I had to practice problematizing both the student and the teacher. Now we all know conferring ain't easy. Patrick Gallup, love them. Because in conferring, whether it's with the student in front of you or now as a doctoral student mentoring other people, it includes active listening, full focus, active listening, authentic questions, deciding on some type of instruction, and doing all of this instantaneously. This is tough. So being aware of subtext and thinking about that going into a conference can in Increase the intentionality of objectivizing or subjectivizing students, working on or working with students. Increase the intentionality of finalizing or problematizing, knowing about or learning with. And Matusoff and Smith um, found in their study that teachers' strong use of subjectivizing and problematizing is associated with a community of learners model of education, which if we look at what a reading workshop is, that's really what it is. We're creating a community of readers that share together. Thank you. <laughs>